Thank you for tuning in to Grieving Voices. Today, I'm very excited for my guest to be on. Um, hard guy to pin down, but he's given me his time and my listeners his time. And so thank you so much, Ken Ross, for being here. My pleasure. Great to be here. And uh, I just want to start first. Actually, I should probably introduce you. See, I'm already screwing up. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Scratch that. Let me start over. <clears throat> Next. <laughs> I got to introduce you. Seriously. Okay. Thank you for tuning in to Grieving Voices. I'm very excited for today's guest, Ken Ross, uh, the founder and president of Dr. Keebler. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Day three. <laughs> <sighs> this just shows how nervous I am. Okay. All right. Keebler Khan Cookies, the man who needs no introduction, <laughs> or at least the woman anyway, the mom who needs no introduction. <laughs> I know it's Kubler, like what in the world? Okay. Thank you for tuning in to Grieving Voices. Today, I'm very excited to have my special guest, Ken Ross. He is the son of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross, the founder of the EKR Foundation in 2006 and president and he's also served on the board of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Center from 1989 to 2005. Ken was the principal care provider for his mother in the last nine years of her life until her passing in 2004. His responsibilities include handling over 80 publishers of Dr. Kubler-Ross's work in 43 languages, public relations, copyright and trademark issues, website maintenance, developing international Kubler-Ross chapters, developing strategic partnerships, as well as preserving her archives. While growing up, he traveled with her extensively while on her numerous foreign trips, witnessing her lectures and workshops. Ken has lectured on his mother's legacy for hospices in various conferences in South America, Asia, and Europe. There are several film projects that Ken is currently a consultant on, including a major motion picture, a television series, and various documentaries, both foreign and domestic. He is a professional photographer by trade, and he has photographed 102 countries. He is also the author of Real Taste of Life, a journal by Ken Ross and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross from 2002, and Tea with Elizabeth. Thank you so much for gracing me with your presence and for wow, your time today. It was a mouthful, <laughs> but it, it, you have led you. a very interesting and fascinating <laughs> life, as has your mother. Um, I started to dig into her book, The Wheel of Life, and a memoir of living and dying. Um, I felt drawn to that one of all of all the choices that are there out there. Um, I think just because I have had recently gone through uh, end of life doula certification, I think the 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 dying process and just the end of life experiences um, is kind of fascinating me at the moment and. Um, I've picked some stuff out of the book that I would like to talk about at some point, but sure. thank you. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. That's what I'm here for. Spread so what, let's start with you. Um, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, before we started recording, um, we could make this whole podcast episode about your mom. Um, there's lots of content out there available about your mom, but I am curious and interested in learning about how having Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross as a mom has shaped you into the person you are today and the impact that her work has had on your life. Um, you know, you don't see things as they're happening, right? You never realize what's happening as it's happening. You have to go back and go, oh my God, that's why I did this. That's why I did that. So, you know, at the time I had two parents growing up who were doctors and they both worked with dying people or dead people. My father was a pathologist. So my father was bringing home human brains into the kitchen, leaving them, you know, because I had to go to a new hospital the next day. <clears throat> and my mom's bringing home dying people who are my age and sometimes younger, sometimes older, but you know, dying people are coming through the house. Human brains are sitting in the kitchen. It was a very unusual childhood. And so, you know, death was something we heard about, if not every week, every day. And we heard it at the dinner table. <clears throat> and I met people who are my age who are dying. So it certainly made a big impression. And every time I went on a trip with my mother, you know, we're meeting dying people backstage after her conferences and at the workshops and, you know, people stopping her in the airports and so forth. So 
it was death, death, death. <laughs> so it made me quite paranoid and neurotic about like every little bump and nook you know I had on my body. <laughs> but but so at the time, you know, it kind of freaked me out because I heard about it too much. But it did impress upon me that life is short and precarious for many people. And even for people who live a, a full long life, it still seems short because I'm meeting people in their 70s and 80s who are dying and they're like, Ken, my God, like, you know, just a few minutes ago, I was a kid. Like, what happened? Like, life went by in a blip. And so they're like, yo, really go out and really think about life. Just don't take it for granted. You know, really seize this opportunity you have. And you have a beautiful opportunity with your mother to do things that a lot of people don't get to do and kids don't get to do. So anyway, my dad had these National Geographics, and I thought, wow, well, if life is short and precarious, you know, this would be an amazing way to spend your life. These photographers go out and see all these tribes and hang out, you know, of helicopters, they climb mountains, they meet movie stars. That seems like an amazing way, if life is so short, to go out and really live it big. And I was very shy and very quiet. And so I thought, oh, wow, with the camera, I don't really have to talk. I can still be in my shy, comfortable space, but I can go out and photograph landscapes and nature and meet tribal people. And, and that would be an amazing way just to see the world, which is kind of a mysterious place. So I set out to go shoot 101 countries, and that's what I did. Um, but I studied banking just as a backup because my father was a traditional family guy, and he didn't want me going off on some flaky you know, concept of being a National Geographic photographer. So I studied banking like a good Swiss boy. You know, my mom was Swiss. So I thought, well, that's my backup. You know, I could be a good Swiss banker, but uh, what I really wanted to do was travel and, and take photographs. So, and my mom really pushed me to be like a gypsy, basically, and live my life outside the box. Whereas my father wanted me in the box. So constant struggle between the parents, right? And my father did not believe in life after death. My mother did. So a lot wow. of conflicts growing up between the parents because you respect them both. They're both geniuses know their stuff but you know you're kind of pulled in two directions at the same time and that was a little challenging i want to circle back to that that the the opposite belief system but first i just want to say that i like just when i was a kid i wanted to be a national geographic photographer oh cool and i was you know my dad was diagnosed at when i was six with cancer and I watched him, you know, slowly decline over the next two years. And he died when I was eight. And so I had that first early exposure and people, my grandma had died too in that time of cancer. And so I had been exposed to death and dying and, you know, maybe not really necessarily understanding the, the, the fragility of life, how fragile it is, but, or really grasping that idea. But I grew into that wanting to this, this urge to travel was in me. If it wasn't a national geographic photographer, I wanted to be an airline stewardess. I mean, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the idea was to get out and get away and travel and participate. yeah. Yeah. Participate and like, Grab see, <laughs> yeah. See what else is out there beyond, you know, my, my own four walls. Mm -hmm. um, now, did you actually shoot for national geographic or that was just something that sparked I your well, I wanted to be a National Geographic, you know, kind of photographer. I wanted to go out and travel like hardcore yeah. and get into, you know, remote villages in Africa and South America. And, and so I didn't shoot for them, but I have sold them a number of photographs over the years as stock photography. Can I ask then how that experience, because when you started doing that and you were on this excursion of 101, now 102 countries, uh, did that how did that morph into the work that you're doing with death and dying? And how did that actually in being exposed to those different cultures, what have you taken away from what you've learned? Uh, well, um, so I was doing photography you know, as a hobby, as a kid, I was shooting concerts and, and things like that um, and traveling with my mother. And when she was giving a workshop, I would go take pictures, right? So, cause she's working for eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So I go shoot and at the end of the day, I'd hook up with my mom and then we'd be meeting, you know, shamans and Eskimos and fortune tellers and Zulu witch doctors and you name it because my mother loved indigenous people. She thought these people really get life and death and they're not like hung up on death and they really see it, everything as a circle. 
So she mm -hmm. really wanted me to meet all these people, you know, and I saw tables floating in the air and everything you can imagine. <clears throat> so that's all building up inside of me. And uh, I'm traveling with mom and going off to college and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was like, well, you know, banker's realistic, but photography is really fun. So, and getting exposed to death more and more. And I'm still traveling with my mom, even after I got out of school and trying to figure out which way I was gonna go. So anyway, I did become a professional photographer. I moved to Australia and then moved to New York and I ended up living in like 13 cities and four countries. You know, because my mom was definitely like, go out and be a gypsy and be crazy and you know, not only live outside the box, but just realize there is no box, right? Just do it all. And you know, <clears throat> being a photographer, I'm climbing mountains, I'm going to discos in Beirut, I'm hitchhiking in Zimbabwe, and really living what I think is a fantasy life for most people. <clears throat> Even with no training as a photographer, I just did it. So that was great. So it's, it's all about challenging your fears, right? And having the perspective that life is short, you know, don't live your life with regrets. So most people, I think 90% plus of their regrets are things they didn't do versus things they did do, right? So we have to remember like all these regrets are things we didn't do. We lived our lives fear-based. We were afraid to tell these people we love them, embrace people we had fights with, you name it. And so, you know, the time to make amends is now. The time to take chances is now. You know, I just went to Iraq for a vacation, right? I mean, that's a little unusual, but I'm challenging my fears. I'm challenging the preconceived notions of Iraq is a dangerous place. You know, I've read about it. I've embraced different cultures. I'm, I love diversity. Uh, and, you know, I just found my rhythm and just, I went there, I had a great time. I had no hassles. And so just, you know, and also seeing my mom in the press, I just see how much the press kind of misrepresents things. They focus on the negative, you know, and when I go out, you know, I just have an amazing time when I travel. I, I've rarely had any problems in 102 countries. I've been to nine countries in the Middle East and done all sorts of crazy things and met strangers and ended up sleeping in their house in Africa and Asia and different places. And I never had a problem really. So, you know, I just don't focus on that negativity that we're fed so much. Like we're just fed all this fear, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I hate that because I just find life a very positive experience. It's not meant to be perfect, but you know, you can take any experience and you can find a positive outcome from it, even from death and grief. It can help you grow and learn it and embrace love even more and more. So yeah. I did that for, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 years. And then, um, as you may know, my mom's house was burnt down when she was trying to start a AIDS hospice for abandoned babies. And so I brought her down to Arizona and I ended up taking care of her for nine years. That was a crazy difficult experience. And then after she died, we had people writing us every day from around the world. So again, it wasn't my plan, but you know, after taking care of my mother, I was handling all our business affairs and realizing how complicated it was and how a lot of people are, you know, uh, misrepresenting her work and abusing her and cheating her and you know all the stuff that goes along with fame and and having a, a brand. So as a son, it really bothered me, and so I began, you know working with all our publishers and all the press and all the stuff that I wasn't used to and had no experience with. Um, and then I started the foundation thinking the foundation would do all the work and I would get to be a photographer. So now it's been 16 years or so and I realize that's not how foundations work. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm still kind of figuring out how foundations work after 16 years, but uh, yeah, I'm slowly getting better at it. And the last three years have been a great time for the foundation. We've grown a lot internationally and there's been some nice big press articles on mom. They've named a couple streets after mom. NHPCO just um, had a nice memorial to mom. They have a whole exhibit on her in their headquarters in Washington. And uh, the American Journal of Bioethics just devoted an entire uh, issue to her. We just donated all my mom's papers to Stanford. They're gonna develop a digital library. So oh, the last couple nice. years have been very exciting in mom's legacy, even though she's not around. Yeah. I. And like I mentioned before we started recording, it's like you hear all the time on TV and the news and different things, you'll say the five stages of grief, you know, and that's what people seem to latch on to and in, in all of her amazing work that she has accomplished and did in her life. Mm -hmm. And 
um, I was just listening to something this morning that talked about, um, it was talking about, it was about mindfulness. And the one thing that in mindfulness at the end of life, there were, it was like a research that was done and they interviewed people at the end of life. And all these people, every single person had said that their greatest regret was that they had not lived true to themselves. Right. And right. you're not driving the right car. You're not in the right neighborhood. You don't have the right friends or whatever. Like, you know, it's like society imposes all these like guilts and fears and expectations on you, which are so artificial. And there's this part in her book where um, in the wheel of life where she had talked about where she quit her job because she had decided to work with dying children. Um, someone had just asked her the question, why don't you work with dying children? And she's like, you know, good question. Why don't I, <laughs> you know, um, but she had quit her job. And then that's what really led her because they wouldn't um, allow her to uh, kind of counsel um, people who couldn't pay. Mm-hmm. And she says, um, I was not about to stop that practice. If you hired me, you also get what I stood for. Um, and I just, there's like conviction that I, you know, I, I feel that sense of conviction in what she said there. And that's what led to her doing the lectures. But that's what I also hear what she's kind of passed down to you and that, nope, this is what I'm going to do. I don't want to live, put myself in a box. I don't want to limit myself. And that's a beautiful gift she gave you, I think. Yeah, it's been amazing. It's been you know, exactly my fantasy when I was a kid. I like did everything just about you could possibly do that's, you know, quasi reasonable. So, so yeah, I feel like, you know, I want to live a life that I wouldn't mind doing a hundred times over and not be bored ever. You know, you want to live that dream life, right? And it's never going to be a dream. There's going to be heartache and sorrow and betrayal and everything else, but you know, you embrace it and just move past it. So what do you think are, do other cultures have a one up on us when it comes to death and dying than, than we do here in Western society? Well, I think it's kind of like 50 years ago when my mom, you know, began her official work with death and dying is that um, we hide death in a closet, you're right? You know, old age homes is so we can like not see people get old because we don't want to deal with it. Just stick them in a home and hide them away so you know we don't have to face it you know and funerals you know used to be at home dying people used to bring your uncle home and leave him in the living room for a couple of days so that you know you could see him and have that death be a part of your life and now you know it's like oh we're gonna hide him in a hospital we're gonna hide him in a old age home we're gonna hide him in a whatever a hospice whatever so um yeah that's the problem is that we hide death right yeah, they would even take pictures with those deceased loved ones. Yeah, I mean, you know. You, you can even tell life. they were actually dead, right? You know, because it was black and white, but yeah. Right, you know, and they and they make up bodies to look like they're artificially. They had the rouge and pretty up the mm-hmm. hair and, you know, make death look like it's they're just sleeping, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's the problem. It was a problem 50 years ago, and it's still the problem 50 years later. Like in other countries, you know, death is a part of life. You see it you know, in front of you. Um, They don't really hide it the way they do in Western culture. You know, in other cultures too, they have their own rituals and their ways of doing things. And and I think that's like with our rituals in the West here with funerals, um, we've kind of gotten away from being participants as family members, right? In the process. And, you know, we, we hire a the funeral home to basically handle everything for us and, right. and handle all the details casket, like that made my mother crazy closed casket like come on you gotta like say goodbye to the person you can't say goodbye to a box like, right. that's not saying goodbye <laughs> so. right so in what is your what has been your most what is your most favorite part of of all the work that your mom had done and accomplished in her life what has been your favorite piece of it <laughs> that's a tough one so, um so i got my cat here he's gonna be pushing against the screen here um you know i love the way my mom brought in humor to you know her work you know everyone thought oh kubler ross she must have been really serious right <laughs> you know you look at radio lab's instagram page right now and their last photograph they published was my mom wearing an et outfit Right, she's in a wheelchair, but she's still in an ET outfit, 
like giving people, she called it the finger because she had chronic pain syndrome. So she didn't like being hugged, so she'd give them the finger like E.T. But, you know, and she brought a lot of humor into her work and lightheartedness. And, you know, even though she was working with dying children all week long, she was totally funny and totally full of life and, uh, you know, just gave you energy, right? So she just showed that it doesn't have to be depressing and sad, you know. I mean, it is to some degree, of course, but, you know, you can also refocus your energy on life too. So you mentioned that there was this difference in opinion of life after death between your mother and your father. And Mm -hmm. um, how did that play out ultimately? Uh, It it was challenging because, you know, my father had, I don't know how he had like 200 brains in his office, like in a room, right? And he's, you know, he's a genius. He's director of his department at Loyola in Chicago. He's writing all these papers and doing all these lectures. And, you know, he was, you know, they're going to name a, name a library after him, right? The guy was a smart guy. He studied, uh, you know, he went to medical school in German. He didn't speak German. So imagine going to medical school in a language you don't speak. I mean, that is a driven, intelligent person, right? So, you know, he knew what he was talking about. And so did my mother, right? She's the world's leading expert on death and dying. <laughs> You're talking to this genius neuropathologist, so, you know, it's hard for the kids. What do we say? Like, nothing we can say <laughs> to contribute to that conversation. But, you know, they they didn't fight. They disagreed, but they disagreed politely. No, no, Elizabeth, it's this chemical and that chemical and this and that. And Elizabeth's like, no, we had a blind person come in, and they could tell you how many people were in the room and what color they were wearing and da-da-da. And so, you know, it was like... It was like a no-win disagreement. So they just agreed to disagree, and that was fine. It was just like that. It, you know, father had a great sense of humor, and they both just kind of laughed about it. So it wasn't a big deal. But, you know, it left us both going, hmm. I once went to uh, a kinesiologist, and they did their little, you know, kind of hocus-pocus thing, and they said, you are conflicted between your parents because you respect them both, you love them both, but they were in different energies. I'm like, wow, this person is really good. <laughs> How wow. did you pick that up? <laughs> so, so your dad's opinion of that never changed, never no, wavered? It didn't waver, but of course, there's this famous Rose story that goes along with my mother that when my sister was like six or seven years old, he said he's going to send her flowers on the first snowfall after he died. And that's basically what he did. He sent flowers and he died that afternoon. And then the next day, my sister got flowers on her front doorstep in the snow, you know, 25, 30 years later. So what did that mean, right? So my mother's like, I told you so. (laughs) (laughs) So my mother thinks she won that argument. (laughs) Did she? I don't know. (laughs) We'll find out. There was um, a beautiful story about um, a boy named Jeffy in in her book, The Wheel of Life, uh, really like moved me. but Jeffy was a boy that um, she had worked with and he was had leukemia much of his life. Are you familiar? Do you remember this story? I remember the name, but I can't remember that particular story because I've heard like 10,000 stories. I'm sure. He had the tricycle or the bicycle. He had gotten a bicycle for his birthday and he oh, told right. his dad. His brother, the one with the brother? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. And uh, But the beautiful thing about her work is that she helped families I mean, she gave the family a beautiful gift in that, in this boy too, because he wanted to go home and he helped him, he helped him communicate that to his parents. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they took him home because there was nothing more. He didn't want to do, he didn't want to do any more chemo. He was done. So they took him home. And then he said to his dad, because he had gotten this brand new bicycle, but he never got to ride it. He told his dad, take this bike down. And he said, and you, Dr. Ross, you're going to hold my mom back. Right. Because he knew that she could not not, you know, ride with him and hold him and make sure right. he doesn't kind of fall and or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so as the adults, they all held each other back. And he went and rode around and he had the training wheels on. Mm-hmm. He comes back and he felt like he had won, you know, won an Olympic gold. He was just right. beaming. And asked the father to take off the training wheels and and went up to his room and he said, 
tomorrow you, you know, tell my brother to come upstairs, but no, no adults. Mm -hmm. I don't want any adults. And, um, but the thing that he had said before he even left the hospital, I have to find it here. Um, oh, what's the wrong story? It's also in um, the tunnel and the light. But he said something about you adults. You adults don't get it or I can't remember right, yeah. what it was. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll have to edit this out. Shoot. I was going <laughs> to. Anyway, but he ended up giving the bike to his brother for his birthday because he knew that he was going to pass away. But even before they left the hospital, he told Dr. Ross, he had said to her, you know, because she said, well, I don't have time to go home with all my patients or, you know, all the all the children I help. And he's like, don't worry, it'll only be 10 minutes. Like he knew he was going to go home and die. Right. Um, but it was just a beautiful story. It truly, truly touched me. But I just think that that's the beautiful thing about her work is that she assisted so many people in having good deaths. Yeah, she. my mother was a master at um, kind of pulling out symbolic nonverbal language is what she called it. And she said like a very important part of her work is that my mother, she had like antenna and she could just pick up things that were not said verbally, but she could pick up things. And she just knew like, she's like had a whole radar station on her head. She was picking up all the stuff, nonverbal communication. And she could just find out stuff about patients in seconds and go, okay, well, we got to talk here because this person's about to go or this person needs to say something, it's going to be a big breakthrough. And she was just a master at that. And she did it to me too, which made me crazy. You couldn't keep any secrets from my mom because she just pick up stuff. So Very intuitive and yeah. empathic likely yeah, too. Yeah, incredibly. Like just the stories that, you know, I heard about my mom picking up stuff are just out of this world. So, I mean, I mean, that's just one little blip of her work right. of what and she did. Yeah, hundreds and hundreds of stories I've heard just on that particular topic. I have my favorites, but I mean, you know, everyone I talk to, oh my God, you should have seen what your mother did. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. She does that all the time, every week. <laughs> so, Give me one of your favorites. My very favorite, I heard after she died, I heard it from her best friend in the late 60s was this, the hospital was really mad at her doing this work with dying patients. So they assigned her this big, like six foot three African-American priest who turns out was also a Black Panther, right? So here's my mom, five foot tall, Swiss accent, with a six foot three African American Black Panther priest coming down the hallway. So it's quite the scene, right? <laughs> In the 60s, that was pretty heavy duty. <laughs> so, yeah. so anyway, within a few weeks, uh, the priest like, like fell in love, not romantically, but with my mom and her work and said, okay, I'm not gonna stop her, I'm gonna protect her. So if any doctor got in my mom's face, this you know, six foot three guy said, you get out of here or else it's gonna be trouble. And so they weren't about to get in a fight with a priest. So they'd head out and Elizabeth would do her work. But anyway, he said like one time we came into a room, and this woman had cancer of the jaw and throat and had her mouth wired shut. And we sat down and he said, your mother seemed to have an entire conversation with her, even though she could only grunt and you could not understand a single word the woman said your mother understood her and was answering her and a woman would grunt, your mother would talk, the woman would grunt and this went back and forth for a few minutes. And then your mother turned to me and said, get this woman an apple and walked out of the room with no explanation. And he said, well, why would I get a woman whose mouth is wired shut an apple? It didn't make sense. But he said, your mother's very famous and he didn't say no to your mother. <laughs> so I went down to the cafeteria, got this woman an apple and she started crying. And so I said to her, can you please explain what transpired between you and Elizabeth? If I get a piece of paper and a pen, can you write down what happened? And she wrote that she had been a school teacher and she wanted to get one more apple like her students used to give her before she died. Mm. You know, and, and this guy's like, she did not say a word. Like you cannot, how did Elizabeth come up with this? It's just unbelievable. But your mother just did, did this like every day. It's incredible. Wow, wow. That's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good story. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's lots of, and she did it in her workshops every week too. Just craziness. Like there was a hundred people sitting around in a workshop and one person wouldn't participate and my mother wouldn't allow that. So he brought the guy into the circle and he said, look, I'm homeless. I only came for the food. Somebody gave me this as a gift. 
I appreciate what you're doing, but you know, there's nothing you can do or say to get me to participate. I am dead inside. So my mother sat there for like 15 minutes, not a word. And the staff's like, oh, this guy has stumped Elizabeth finally. And so she said, let's sing a song. And my mother picked a song. They all hundred people started singing it. And this guy broke down crying uncontrollably. And when he composed himself, he said, that's a song I used to sing to my son before he died. He was 16. So how did Elizabeth pick that song, right? I mean, unbelievable. Yeah, I literally have goosebumps. I don't know if you can yeah, see I it. Mean, it's like, you know, she had the hotline to, uh, to the big guy upstairs. Wow. I wonder if someday she'll be a saint, maybe a sainthood. <laughs> saint and devil. <laughs> she was naughty but nice. <laughs> So what is it? You know, that's the thing. Like, she seems like this feisty, like, don't, you're, no one's going to stop me. Oh, yeah. You know, like, very driven. And where does that come from? Where did that come from? Came from her father. <laughs> her father was incredibly stubborn. Um, and she was just constantly butting heads with her father. Because she was stubborn, too, naturally. But I think her father was, like, this thing, like, who was going to be more stubborn? <clears throat> and so... Um, you know, my mother was just driven from day one. She was doing things which were totally ridiculous and no one was gonna stop her, right? I mean, when she was a kid, she had a pet monkey. Nobody in rural Switzerland in the 1930s had a pet monkey. <laughs> my mother had a pet monkey. She had African dolls. Swiss girls didn't play with African dolls. Where did that come from? You know, my mother went to one of the neighbors who was dying and asked him what it was like to be dying when she was like seven years old. Swiss girls didn't do that, you know, but my mother did, right? I mean, just everything was always focused on, like, <laughs> inquiring, want to know what life's about, what's death about, what, you know, I want to know. I want this. <laughs> Don't get my way. She would beat up the school bully if he picked on, like, her sister. You know, and she was tiny. So she was just driven from day one. Do you have any doubts that, when we come into this world that the path is kind of laid out in front of us. And yes, it's our free will to choose and, and follow those insights or follow those intuitive things that spark our interest or our curiosity. But um, do you believe that that is just something that like she knew her path, like she just yeah. followed the, her curiosity wherever it led her? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, she said, you know, we're all here to figure out what our path is. And most people don't really find it or they find pieces of it, but they don't really find the center of the river. And my mom was like, you know, <laughs> in the center of the river from day one. She just knew what she had to do. And she was always just striving for more and more. And didn't matter if it was realistic or possible. <laughs> she just did it. <laughs> well, and she didn't listen to the naysayers, even as a young child, right? She just... Oh, yeah. She could have felt like when someone said to her, well, who has a pet monkey? Well, oh yeah, that's kind of weird, you know? And, you know, but she didn't, she continued on. Like she marched to the beat of her own drum. Oh yeah. I mean, her stubbornness is like legendary. <clears throat> uh, during her, one of her last TIAs or strokes uh, after the fire, like I'm sitting with her and she's in the middle of having a stroke, right? And I'm trying to get her to go to the hospital. And she's like, no, get me a cigarette. You know, I'm like, Mom, you're having a stroke. Yeah, okay, get me a cigarette. Like, in the middle of a stroke, who asked for a cigarette in the middle of a stroke? I mean, oh, she's like, don't take me to the hospital. That'll kill me. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, just insane. <laughs> so. Do you mind sharing what her last words for you were? Well, it, it's really interesting. It wasn't her, like, very last word, but, you know, for nine years I took care of her. And, you know, she was angry to some degree. I mean, she gets bashed for that, too. It's like, okay, well, like I said, your house is burnt down. All your research, life's research is burnt down. Your favorite animal shot. The police declared an accident. You know, you have paralyzing stroke. You can't garden. You can't do your work. You can't do anything. You sit in a chair. Why would you be angry? <laughs> like, so I was like, hello. She's a human being. So she was expected to be like, you know, Buddha or something. But... Um, so for nine years, she's like, you know, she was a little angry, as you can see on the Oprah interview, it's on YouTube. Um, but her version of angry is like, you know, she's still like laughing and smiling too. So it's not like she's like, ah, with a knife, ah. <laughs> so, um, 
But anyway, she said, oh, I want to die. I want to die. You know, she's not suicidal. She's like, okay, I've done all my work. I'm ready to check out. It's no big deal. Let's just go. <clears throat> so after nine years of saying she wants to die, she's ready to die. Like out of the blue, I'm in her room and she says, Kenneth, I'm not ready to die. I don't want to die right now. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so I'm like, what did you say? And then she changed the subject. Mm. Like, oh, get me a taco or something or just totally like, oh, get me some flowers. Or I'm like, wait, wait, no, what did you say? And she, she would not go back to it. And I'm like, what did that, what was that after nine years? <clears throat> and then a few weeks later, she died. And it took me like two, three years to realize that, oh, my mom learned her final lesson. That's what she's always saying. When we learn our lessons, we're allowed to graduate, which means die, make our transition. And so when my mom let go over all of her anger and learned her final lesson to let people love her and take care of her, not being the one in charge, then she was allowed to graduate, mm. right? I mean, it's like, wow, <laughs> she was totally right. That's exactly what she said her whole life. And she learned her final lesson. She was allowed to make her departure. That reminds me of, uh, I did a podcast interview with um, a, a medium who um, mentioned that she, one of her most memorable clients was a mother who had lost a son to suicide. And the mother was so concerned that the son was not in heaven, you know, was not like his, like he was really being, his soul was tormented or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the medium told her, well, the son told the medium and the medium communicated that, no, he's in school, that he's, he's in school because he didn't learn his lessons in the physical plane that he had to learn it. You know, his soul had to learn it after. And so that he was in school learning his lessons. Mm -hmm. So it made me think of that. And so what I'm curious then too, like what the lessons that your mom has passed on to you about the afterlife, what has stuck with you mostly? Um, well, again, in that department, I have to say I'm torn between my parents because my father did mm. not believe in life after death. Mm -hmm. Smart guy, genius, great guy. Mother, absolutely. And, you know, I saw any number of things that have no rational explanation. Um, so I guess I kind of take a hybrid view of both my parents and my only concern is like what's now today. I have no interest. Like if you had a, a fortune teller medium who could, who was absolutely, you knew was like the real thing could tell you everything. I would have zero interest because I love the surprise. I don't want to know. <clears throat> and I don't think pragmatism is the right word. I don't know what the word is, but. I'm just like, my mother, mother taught me is that whatever happens is what happens is fine. It's like, everything's fine. That's what's going to happen. I, you know, my only fear, I guess, is I have no fear of death. I only fear like the things that I can control. So I can't control death, but I can control how I live. So mm -hmm. my fear, I guess, would be like wasting my life or not living to the max, right? So that's my only fear is like, oh, I've got to use every opportunity. I've got to look for the clues because that's what I can control. I can't control if, you know, a, a meteor falls on my head. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried the plane's going to crash or, you know, I'm going to die or whatever because I have no control over that. So I only fear the things I can control, the things that are in my power. Did so you... I have no interest in life after death in that whatever happens going to happen and that's nature and i totally embrace whatever whatever is real you know in the afterlife that's great if there's no life after death that'd be great if there's life after death, that's great if there's reincarnation that's great i just i just totally maybe as buddhist i don't know i just whatever happens i accept because that's what that's the nature of the universe and so i accept it a thousand percent so i'm not I don't care what happens. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm just like at peace with the reality of what is. Very much you're in the present. And that's a lot of, that's a very big problem for a lot of people. And so I congratulate you for that because I mean, I, either a lot of people are stuck in the past mm -hmm. or they're stuck in the future. They're always thinking ahead and they're always, you know, planning for the, for tomorrow and next week and the next year, but yet they can't like just, 
be still in the moment, you know? Yeah, like so every day I wake up that. and I have this thing called the dice theory. Like every day I want to like roll the dice, meaning <clears throat> I want to make something happen, mm. right? I don't know what it is. Uh, sometimes, you know, I feel like, oh, you know what? I should call 10 people today. Call 10 people and see what they're doing. Maybe they'll give me an idea or maybe I'll give them an idea. Maybe call 10 strangers, go on LinkedIn and just contact 10 people and see what happens. It's like I'm just rolling the dice of life going, hey, let's make something happen. Well, let's just go out and take a drive and maybe I'll discover a new restaurant or a new thing or maybe I'll meet somebody. Or So it's my dice theory. Like every day make something happen just by chance or by feeling the groove. Like, you know, oh, today I think I should work on my mom's tapes or my mom's books or call some publishers and just make something happen. So I have a, every day I want to throw that dice to like make things happen because the dice will bump into other dice and start something you wouldn't have expected had you not thrown the dice. So I create a chain reaction. I'm gonna call my group in Peru and see, hey, maybe we can come up with an idea just by having a talk. So I work my dice theory every day. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Is that how you connected with me on LinkedIn? Yeah. You rolled the dice? <laughs> That's it, here we are. That's uh, part of the dice theory. And I rolled the dice right back yeah. at you. Well, I'll take yeah. that as a handshake. Yeah, Will you be on my that? podcast? Yep. Yeah. And here we sit, right? That's totally the dice theory, right? Like if I didn't like reach out, then we wouldn't be here today. And maybe you'll meet somebody else from my mom's family and you'll have something. Because that's not only for me, it's for other people. The I impact. roll it for for the universe and for everybody and to make you know things happen for everybody, including Absolutely me, but that. also for other people. I love so, that. I, I have the dice theory. That's, that's my theory. So. Maybe that's a book title. The dice theory. Dicey, living better, a dicey life. You better, <laughs> yeah, you better not <laughs> jot that down. <laughs> I get the first copy. <laughs> yes. Okay. You're part of the dice theory. So it works, right? It works. You're here, yes. and I'm here, and this is like you know. But every day, I want to roll the dice, and like, I just don't want to sit back and wait. You know, if you sit back, maybe it'll happen, but. If you throw the dice, then you're participating. It's like, and you know, it's like I walk down the street and I, I talk to people in countries where I go and things happen. Oh, here's a dice theory. I had two weeks off and I bought a one-way ticket to Chile. I got the first night hotel and then I had no plans. I didn't study a book. I didn't make no idea what's happening in Chile or Santiago. I just flew down there one way. That's it. <clears throat> I'm walking down the street. The first hour, a nice doorway. I take a selfie. An hour later, somebody on Facebook says, oh, I've been writing you from Colombia for three years. I wanted to meet you. Can we have dinner tonight? I'm now in Santiago with my boyfriend. I'm like, yeah, because I have no plans. I'm just throwing the dice. So they, she said, I'm going to bring a translator because I don't speak English. So we met for dinner, and she had my mom's beliefs tattooed on her arm. Right? Wow. She's like a hardcore mom fan. And she said, I want to start a foundation in Chile. I go, great. Well, I mean, you got these tattoos. You're like, seem like you're really a lovely person. You're really like enthusiastic. So I said, if the board doesn't agree within the next 90 days, I will just give you permission to do it because I feel this is right. This is part of my dice theory, right? So within 90 days, the board said yes. She started a chapter and her dream was to start the first pediatric hospice in Chile, in Santiago. So EKR initiated the first pediatric hospice in Chile because of the dice theory. Because you took a selfie in front of a yes. picture that someone yeah, saw. Yeah, because I just oh bought a one-way ticket to Chile. I thought, oh, I just feel like I want to do this. I need to do this. So this is the dice theory. Like there's a pediatric hospice being built now in Santiago because of the dice theory, right? It's like, it uh, works. It that's really so amazing. Works. Yeah, it's it following works. the intuitive hits. Like yeah. you had this intuitive thought, like, oh, I'll just book it. You know, it's like, it's one thing to have a thought. It's another thing to follow up and take action on that thought. And how many thoughts in a day do we let just slip by us? You know, just picking up the phone and telling someone, hey, how are you doing? I, I've been thinking about you. Hey, I do that a lot. Love you, you know, and yeah. maybe next week they die in a car accident or something, but at least you reached out and like, you didn't have unfinished business. So my mom's saying is like, don't die with unfinished business. business. Right? That's what we like, say in grief recovery too. Yeah, you know, so that was like business. her thing. Like in the seventies, uh, her workshops were all about dealing with your unfinished business, right? Oh, so, so you can uh, have a good death. Yeah, yeah. So I just went to Kurdistan in northern Iraq, right? And I'm, I'm like, well, okay, this is nice as for me, but it's kind of 
that's not maybe not hedonistic, but it's like, okay, I, I want to give back too. <clears throat> so I reached out to a board member who travels a lot and I said, do you have any contacts in Iraq? And he said, oh yeah, I know uh, an oncologist in uh, the eastern part of Kurdistan. So I wrote her, <clears throat> I didn't hear back. And when I got there, I thought, I'm gonna try one more time. I reached out and she said, oh yeah, well, can we have a meeting tomorrow morning? I'm like, yeah, great. So I went there and we had an uh, hour long talk. I toured the hospital. It was very depressing. It was the best hospital supposedly in Iraq. Mm. Um, and so she said, we really need help. So I said, oh, well, we'll give you our palliative care trainings from the foundation if that would help, right? And so then I reached out to the board member who connected us. I said, you know, we need to help this woman. So he's connected her to this worldwide palliative care group. Um, so I'm hoping that will lead to things too, but that's just because uh, I'm like, oh, I should like do something for mom and the foundation while I'm in Kurdistan, right? So it's also part of the, the theory of just like, you know, it's like, you know, it's great for me having a nice trip and my photography, but that's like, it's, it works better with karma if, you, if it goes both ways and I do something for other people. So, so that was a nice example too. It's like we've just given them uh, 11 classes and we're gonna be sending them some more classes and you know, try to connect them some people to get some more trainings and they have a lot of problems there with money and lack of pain medication and so forth. And that I can't do anything about, but at least we can help train their doctors. Which will be huge. So the ripples impact. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. The dice theory. I want to kind of come back to something, you know, that I asked earlier about your mom and at the end of her life, have you had any moments of where you felt like, well, that's my mom, like <laughs> tapping me on the shoulder. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, after yes. she passed oh yes um i have a drum set i'm part-time drummer um because i don't do enough and um <laughs> <clears throat> my mom had sense of humor so three or four times within the first year after she died every time i'd bend over to tie my shoe the snare drum would hit just once i mean really loud and it would scare the bajookas out of me <laughs> <laughs> Only when I'm bending over, <laughs> like, you know, when it's like maximum freak out effect. <laughs> so I'm in the house by myself and bang. Undeniable, so, right? Yeah, that's like, mom, you're gonna give me a heart attack. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and then once I was in uh, my bedroom closet, my cat had had kittens, sitting on the floor with my girlfriend at the time. And I clearly heard my mom's voice say hello with her Swiss accent. I'm like, wow, I totally projected mom's voice that time. I was like, that was the loudest I've ever heard my mom's voice. And I look up and my girlfriend's like, what was that? There's a woman in here. I'm like, you heard that? <laughs> She's like, yeah, There's, is the housekeeper in here? I'm like, it's Sunday night at 11. Why would the housekeeper be here? Like, I'm like, no, I think that was mom. She goes, yeah, wow. she had an accent. I'm like, yeah, that was mom. <laughs> Wow. That was weird. <laughs> so that still hasn't swayed your, your thoughts on afterlife, huh? Oh, no, I, I'm totally not saying it's not, but if it is, I don't know what form it is. Yeah. You know, is it the Buddhist idea? Is it the Christian idea? Is it, you know, I mean, you know. The beautiful I'm mystery saying, of I, it, I right? I, it's not I saying I don't care. It sounds too irreverent, but it's like whatever it is, is like, you know. I, I certainly am not saying there's not. I'm saying I don't know 100%. Maybe I know 99%. But the only thing I know 100% is I'm here today, and and that's great. And I just work on today and what I know and what I have and throw those dice. And when I get to that point, then I'll know that for sure. Yeah, so, do we ever really know like, until then? It doesn't matter if, to me if there's life after death or it's not or it's in this form or I come back 100 more times. You know, I just accept it because that's what it is <clears throat> it brings to mind a thought i have just in bringing that up it's because for a lot of grievers or people who are bereaved and had to say goodbye and maybe it was a traumatic death or whatever they have you know unfinished business with that person or whatever it is to feel that connection with someone to know that there's a connection or that there is something after can bring mm -hmm. people a lot of comfort yeah, but mm -hmm. but I I can imagine though in just in knowing who your mom was and the work that she did like you feel connection with her and everything that you do I imagine 
Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, with especially with my mom because I'm totally spoiled because I have you know her two dozen books and I have a hundred audio tapes and I have a hundred videotapes and I have her on YouTube and I have and everywhere I go like on the planet people are like oh I knew your mother I met your mother like you know like everywhere it's like and I hear these I keep hearing new stories it's like how many stories can there be how many people could you have met on this planet like and everywhere I go it's like wow it's like it's it's like she lived ten lifetimes or something because it's not possible that one person did so much in such a short amount of time you know I mean she basically started when she was 40 years old and retired in her 60s and she you know wrote two dozen books and hundreds of chapters and did hundreds of workshops around the world and started the hospice movement to some degree and started the palliative care movement to some degree and she you know I mean she was seeing patients she had a working farm she was a mother she was answering hundreds of thousands of letters she was you know cooking for the workshops because she didn't have enough to do and you know it's just insane how much she did it's like it's not impossible that one person did all this but she did do you think she had any regrets or did she ever voice any regrets yeah, she was just pissed off about her paralysis at the end but <clears throat> that was, well, that was out of her control yeah it was out of her control so um other than that she didn't voice any you know like wishing that she would have started sooner like oh if i'd have started in my 20s i would have had you know this many more years right. to well, I think, you know at the end she said yeah kenneth just do whatever you want if you want to do my work great if you don't want to do my work great do whatever feels right end of story no guilt no expectations no pressure well that was a gift too yeah, yeah. So can if you if you were to summarize her life in five minutes or less. <laughs> Pressure. <laughs> what what has I mean just do a rundown list of like of, of her life, of her work. Um, so I think the what, the main overview, the umbrella is the fabric, um, would say that she was trying to fight the depersonalization of the dying, the, uh, the dehumanization of the death process and of patients, you know, because she said patients are just like numbers in a bed. It's disgusting. Like treat these people as individuals, right? You know, and and respect them and at least give them a few minutes of personal dignity. Just don't treat them like, okay, this is the, the cancer patient, this leukemia patient, that's the whatever, you know. <clears throat> so she was fighting the dehumanization and the medicalization of, of dying, right? So that's her big thing was treating people as human beings, not as patients in, in numbers and beds and things, right? And, and fighting for hospice because she really wanted people to die at home with their families with proper care and pain medication. She said no one should ever die in pain. It's ridiculous that, you know, in the late 19th century and 20th century and 21st century, we haven't made more progress with this. She said there's pain medications. Why are people dying in pain in Africa? Why did I go to this hospital in Kurdistan? There's no pain medication in the 21st century. It's just outrageous. Wow. <clears throat> Um, it's about her talking about the, uh, the uh, four quadrants was really big for her, which nobody talks about, but everyone uses, but I think they don't realize, I think it came from my mother, is that in palliative care, we have you know the balance of the emotional, intellectual, physical, and spiritual. I think this idea came from my mom, which she got it, I think, from Jung, but not used in palliative care. But in the early 70s, my mother was saying, you need to treat patients with the four quadrants. If you just treat the physical, you're not healing a person. You need to deal with the emotional and the intellectual and the spiritual, as well as the physical, right? So the four quadrants was huge for my mother. It was part of everything in my mom's world was a circle, a wheel, right? So the four quadrants of, of health is the basis of palliative care, but I think no one realizes it came from Elizabeth's work. Um, and then what else externalizing your emotions uh learning that everything in life is perspective her work is very much like logotherapy she was friends with victor frankel you know they really mm -hmm. their work was very tied together 
um, challenging your fears, embrace, embracing unconditional love, uh, bioethics, listening, hope. I think these are the wheel that makes up Elizabeth's work. Yeah, I actually had um, Dr. Chris Kerr, who did, was, he's been studying end of life experiences um, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, in the surviving death series on Netflix. Right. I yeah, had him yeah. on the podcast and, mm -hmm. and that, and again, like that just comes back to the end of life training that I had. We, that's what it, we talk about is the whole person. Because mm -hmm. when you, when you die, you come into this world, a whole person, and you go out a whole person, spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally, like all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, it's very important that the, all, all, the whole person is addressed. Right. So they can have a good death. It's mm -hmm. really what it comes down to. Uh, what else? I say, and learning, of course, to listen to symbolic verbal language and symbolic nonverbal language is also extremely important when you're a death doula or end of life worker, doctor working with dying patients, really learning about the symbolic nonverbal language of people is hugely important because a lot of people don't have the words. Children don't have the words. They don't have the vocabulary. Older people are beginning to lose their vocabulary, but they give you signs, like look for the signs. Absolutely. What is, I mean, can you just kind of quickly go over like, because I know her life has been, it, you just, just, you kind of touched on it at the very beginning, like just the, all the stuff that she did. Mm -hmm. um, what's the highlight reel? The highlight reel, wow. Um, another tough question. <clears throat> uh, for me, it's like, you know, the day World War II ended, she joined a peace group and, you know, living in Switzerland, comfortable food, no dangers, no nothing. You know, she could have just easily stayed there and lived a happily comfortable life, but she, she needed to go out and always help the underdog. Um, and so she joined a peace group and her father said, if you leave the house, you, you're never gonna come back. And my mother said, I don't care. Like, this is the right thing to do. People are suffering and we're so comfortable. How can we sit here and not just be horrified how, you know, we have all the stuff and everyone else is suffering around us in Europe. So she hitchhiked, you know, through uh, France and rebuilt the village, right? And, you know, she was starving. I mean, she was like, you know, looking for scraps of bread on, on the ground when she could have been comfortable at home. And then she went up into Denmark. She almost died. And then she went to Germany and she almost died there from burns from a pot that broke and boiling oil spilled on her legs. You know, and then she went to Denmark, Sweden. She went into Poland. She worked in a camp. She lived with the gypsies. She went to the concentration camps. I mean, those two years alone are just, you know, beyond belief what she did and so brave and risking her life over and over and over just to help, you know, dying people and, and people who are just barely hanging on who had nothing. And uh, so that was amazing by itself. And then she, she snuck in a German convoy. Uh, they put her in a box of vegetables and locked it up. Um, and she snuck through the Russian lines and went back to uh, Berlin where she caught a train back to Switzerland. So wow. that was crazy. Um, again, I got the cat. <laughs> Come on, giddy. Um, and then, you know, she went to medical school when women were not going to medical school and she didn't even have the money, she didn't even have the proper accreditation, but because of her relief work during World War II, uh, after World War II, uh, I kind of let her slide in. Wow. And, you know, went to America and then, you know, the whole story with the University of Chicago and fighting the establishment and having doctors spit on her in the hallway and people leaving nasty notes. How dare you talk to dying patients? You know, you're a vulture. You should be ashamed of yourself. I'm going to try to take your license away. You're horrible. <laughs> you know, just for trying to let dying patients have a chance to say goodbye to their families. It's so, incredible. And that wasn't even that long ago. And yeah, if you think about in this grand scheme of things. Yeah, I mean, she had so many stories that, you know, patients dying and their families literally 10 foot away in the hallway. And because it's not visiting hours, they don't let the family say goodbye. And the patient dies alone in a room because of the hospital rules, you know. So 
she was also fighting against the hospital rules and the rules that you can't bring in children and all these ridiculous things that were going on around this kind of sick death culture in America. What do you think helped change that the most? I mean, just because what was there something, a part of her work that really changed that aspect of the dying process? Uh, you know, she shined a light on it um, between her book and that article in Life magazine. You know, and millions of people read about it. And here was this woman willing to talk about death in an open and honest way. And no one was doing that. I mean, almost no one was doing that anyway. And my mother had a capacity to kind of use a simple language, in part because she was a foreigner and didn't have a big command of the English language. But she had this way of just communicating a way that people could understand, whether it was a doctor or a patient or anybody. And, uh, you know, this Life magazine article shines so much light that <laughs> they could no longer deny that there was this huge problem happening in America and, you know, in Western culture and Europe too and elsewhere. So there's so much light shined on it that they could no longer like hide it. So they had to face it. In the midst of, um, oh, kind of froze. Oh, there you are. Are you there? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you kind of froze uh, yeah. there for a minute. Okay. So in the midst of COVID, you know, COVID-19 pandemic and the process and ways that people have not been able to be with their loved ones and the impact that has on the bereaved and those dying. And um, what do you think your mom would have said to that? And do you think that that has actually highlighted how far behind we yet are? Uh, I think it has, because there's been a lot of articles talking about Elizabeth and, and the stages of grief and all that, um, more than usual. Um, but I think my mother would compare COVID to the AIDS crisis, because she said it was just like the AIDS crisis and that there was so much misinformation, there was so much fear, there was so much anger that was being misdirected at things which had nothing to do with the conversation, but people were angry, you know, fearful. There was like a lot of attacks, all these things going on, which is very similar to COVID, right? You know, people always fear, you know, death and it brings out their fear of death, right? And that comes out in various ways and hostility and all this uh, air rage and all these things going on now is this misdirected anger over their fear of COVID and death. So, you know, she would see great parallels because, you know, the, the whole AIDS crisis was a big thing for my mom and demonstrating how society had so much further to go with the conversation about death and dying and grief and facing it honestly and, and dealing with our unfinished business, <laughs> right? So it's just, you know, COVID again demonstrates we haven't dealt with our unfinished business. Yeah, many of us. Yeah. And you since you brought it up the five stages uh can we go there can we talk about that a little bit <laughs> speaking of anger <laughs> <laughs> yeah tell me what tell me really lay the truth out today the truth. Yeah. If you talk to 10 people you'll get 10 versions of the truth okay uh, yeah uh, get it from the horse's mouth like I, yes yeah my version of the truth um so, you know, we have On Death and Dying, uh, the real book, right? Yeah, it's not my, my dummy copy. <laughs> so um, if we go to t page 251, I believe, yes. So if we look in the actual book, right? So if we look here, we see that Elizabeth clearly writes about 10 stages, right? It says one, two, three, four, five, and yet there's 10 boxes. So I think to some degree, the publisher kind of when they were putting together the manuscript, kind of focused it into five stages, I'm guessing. It's a guess because my mom did an entire chapter on hope. Why isn't hope a chapter, be, you know, a stage? Because she does a whole chapter on anger, a whole chapter on bargaining, denial. There's a whole chapter on hope, but they didn't consider that a stage. So why not? I don't know. It doesn't make sense, but anyway, Basically, Elizabeth was trying to say that grief is complex. And back in the 60s, grief was this monolithic thing. And Elizabeth was trying to say that 
grief is made up of different components, right? So it's very ironic that people say to me, oh, you know, Elizabeth didn't get it right because grief is complex and it's not made up of five stages. I'm like, well, okay, the point is that she was saying that grief is made up of individual emotions that, you know, it's not one thing. You, know, you can add anxiety, you can add, you know, my mom talked about preparatory grief, which is the same as anticipatory grief, right? Which became kind of trendy to talk about, I think, in the last two years, mm -hmm. because that's part of COVID, this anticipatory grief. But Elizabeth mentioned it in On Death and Dying 50 years ago. And some people are acting like, you know, it was just like discovered or or identified just recently. But, you know, Elizabeth Can talked I about it half a century ago. And she talked about shock and she talked about hope and she talked about, you know, uh, Claire Bidwell Smith, I think, did a book on the missing stage of uh, anxiety. Elizabeth mentions anxiety 14 times in On Death and Dying, right? So, but no, did, she didn't identify it as a stage, but she identified it as an element of the process that we sometimes go through. So the stages are not meant to be like a ladder or some way to graduate to acceptance. It's just meant to be a way to have a conversation. It's a model, it's not the only model, it's just one model that you want to contribute um, to have a conversation about grief, which people weren't having and still don't really have in healthy ways quite often. So again, it's a model, it's not meant to be the only model, it's meant to be a flexible model. Um, and um, if you look on our website, uh, ekrfoundation.org, you'll see there's various demonstrations of how she talked about the stages as circles, uh, you know, as, as one line going back and forth. <clears throat> um, she talks about dreams as being part of the stages. She talks about a lot of things which are not generally talked about in society. They always fix, fixate on the five stages, but you know, Elizabeth talked about many more things and after 1975, she rarely talked about stages at all. She goes, I think she was on a show with Oprah in 74, 75, and she goes, oh, let's not talk about the stages. They're so old, right, in 75. And then they bashed Elizabeth because that's all she talked about. I'm like, no, that's all you guys are talking about. She talked about 50 other things in society and popular media that just can't let go of it. Right. And they say it doesn't exist, and yet it is the most popular grief theory on the planet. It is, I like, you know, I'm not making that up because it's my mother. It's like, it's been used in over a hundred TV shows and movies, right? It, uh, there's like plays about the five stages. There's novels, there's cartoons, there's games, there's, you know, umpteen dozen plays about the five stages, right? So, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, but it is popular. Like, what does that mean? Does that mean it doesn't exist? I don't know, it must trigger something to some people. There's tens of thousands of articles by people who experience the five stages. So you can't say it doesn't exist because there's tens of thousands of articles by people who said, I experienced it or it helps me. So you can say it's not appropriate to everybody. You can say it's good for some people, but it hurts other people because they think they need to go through it. You know, I would accept that, but you can't say it doesn't exist or it's been disproven that's just, you know, denial. <laughs> so, you know, do you, it's, a, it's a model, period. <laughs> do you think, can I ask, can you clarify, is is how the media and how it, her work has been interpreted around that, has that, um, is that not what she intended? Is, is that what she intended? Did she, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, no. I, I was with her sometimes, you know, she'd see, uh, like the Simpsons had an episode where Simpson goes through the five stages and she'd be like, what? Like, like, what is that bullshit? <laughs> so, <laughs> she'd have to say that word with her Swiss accent. That's bullshit. <laughs> so, so, so that wasn't her intention. Like in, no, in the book was, not. in the book was written in that context right. in the work of working with the dying. Correct. Right. But I mean, I would say, like, even though, like, the BBC just did a, a story saying the rise and fall of the five stages, P.S., we use it to train our workers. I mean, th that doesn't make sense. Like, how can you say the fall of the five stages, P.S., we're using it to train our entire staff? That's like, 
hypocrisy. I think it's I think it's one of those things that people love to hate and they love to yeah. just sink their teeth 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 into. I even said that it's like of all her amazing work that she's accomplished and done, that's the one thing that, like you said, just they people can't let it go. Right, and then they blame Elizabeth because she couldn't let it go. I'm like, she let it go like in '75, so yeah, that wasn't even her focus. Like that wasn't. Yeah. It was just um, such oh, a small part of her work. So we just had uh, the five stages used in the first, um, uh, what's it, the Marvel comics? It's in Deadpool 2. And then Disney just used it as their central focus of their movie Cruella. Mm. And they use it in the actual advertising for the movie. They talk about the five stages. Yeah, and I really think it's more popular than ever. I mean, it's just everywhere I look. It's used, um, there's been over 60 musicians I've identified who've done songs or albums based on the five stages or Elizabeth. I mean, how many grief theories have 60 <laughs> songs written about it or albums written about it or like EPs, like every song is one of the stages. I mean, there's even two bands named Kubler-Ross, you know, so she's like part of popular media, like not only her stages, but she is part of it. Her voice is used in rock songs. It's so bizarre to me sometimes. <laughs> wow. Like, She's embedded in our culture, very yeah, much so. It's just bizarre, though. It's like, wow, where is this going to continue going? <laughs> it's like, when's it going to stop? So did she clarify more of that in her later work in books? Um, she really tried not to talk about it. She was, like, fed up with the, the conversation. But um, right before her death... Uh, we were contacted by another grief worker, David Kessler. And, you know, we were contacted literally every week. Can I write a book with your mother? Can I do this? And uh, finally, you know, I was kind of sick of it too. So I said, you know, maybe it's a good idea. Maybe we should talk about this. So I agreed to let David work with my mom. And they did a book, which I just happen to have here, <clears throat> um, on grief and grieving, in which she further clarified, and David helped clarify the five stages of grief. Um, and again, this book is like in the top 20 or so sellers, you know, of all grief books, even now, you know, 16, 17 years after her mom died. Um, and sometimes it sells better than on death and dying. Um, it's still 17 years after she died. So the book came out when in 2005, I think. Um, but it's still selling extremely well, and we're still selling it, I think, just in the last few months. We sold it in Vietnamese, Cantonese, um, in Mongolian, uh, in Thai. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's like, it has a life of its own. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's almost, it's as if her work has a life of its own, you know. Right. it's. We just sold her work in Farsi for the first time. And it just, wow, it just <laughs> keeps on spreading out. And you, can you share quickly too on the death and die on death and dying her, that first book you mm -hmm. had mentioned to me before we started recording, um, where it, how many languages. And I, I just found it very fascinating. The facts that you shared about. Yeah. The one thing I love about this book is that it's both in Hebrew and Arabic. We sold Arabic for the first time about six months ago in Saudi Arabia. So they have a psychology book in Arabic and Hebrew at the same time is just incredible. It's very unusual and it just speaks to the universality of the language and message of what's held in this book, um, which is not just about the stages, of course, it's about the experiences that dying go through <clears throat> and finding this language that we can have between the doctors and the patients and make it easy to have a, a conversation where there's not normally a, a common language between medical staff and, and laymen who are, who are dying or their families. Um, so the new edition, the 50th anniversary edition, also includes um, her testimony before Congress. In 1972, she testified before the uh, Committee on Aging uh, that the way people died in this country was disgusting and unacceptable, and we had to do something about it. So it's just amazing to have this little Swiss hillbilly <laughs> lecturing the Senate <laughs> how people should die in this country. <laughs> Um, but the whole whole testimony is now in the 50th anniversary edition, which has the blue cover. And I'm not sure anything has really changed. 
you know, I mean, it, it's happening slowly. We have the death duelist now. We didn't have. Yes, that really that's true. That's true. Years ago. So that is a sign of progress. Yeah, it's so slow. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's kind of glacier like <laughs> at times. So what do you think is. Well, I was going to ask you, I forgot. It'll come back. Um, what gives you the most hope? Is that what gives you the most hope for her work? Um, well, the fact that, you know, we have four new languages in one year that we never had in 50 years is just incredible. Like, you know, I think after 50 years, the thing will have, like, you know, died a peaceful death. But, you know, the fact that in this last year, for the first time, we published in Albanian, Arabic, Farsi, and Mongolian. You know, that's amazing for a book that's half a century old. And that, you know, we keep having new foundations uh, pop up around the world and we have these beautiful honors to Elizabeth and people wanting to, you know, start like book clubs in Mongolia. And and we just got contacted by a group in Kenya that wants to do something with the foundation. And yeah, I really see her legacy is very much alive and appreciated. And uh, well, some people are stuck on the five stages. <laughs> Others realize that, you know, Elizabeth's work is very broad spectrumed and universal, you know, culturally and religiously and, and everything wise um it just speaks to people and something yeah. the way elizabeth lived her life just inspires people because so many people write about the wheel of life and say it just radically transformed their life and they were suicidal but after they read the book they want to devote their life to hospice or the dying or they want to live again it's just you know amazing that letters just keep on coming in for decades and decades that's amazing I know as a grief recovery specialist, and we kind of talked about this briefly before, but, um, you know, because there are people that poo poo the five stages and, right. and, and there might be some grief recovery specialists out there listening to this that maybe <laughs> were taught that I don't know, but I personally wasn't in my training. Um, what I was taught was that it, the five stages were about people who were going through terminal illness. Mm -hmm. And that's when you know, that's when she was conducting that work and that it was misinterpreted to be about. All right. That's a common thing people say, but <clears throat> um, let me see if I can bring it up on my computer here. Um, but I see. would add, it's not, I would not deny that all of those things that she mentions mm -hmm. don't happen. Like I absolutely full heartedly, and I think any grief recovery specialist would agree that there are emotions and feelings that someone goes through sometimes in the same moment, you know, you just, you're angry and you're sad and you're, you're all the things, you know, it's, that's the complexity of grief. Right. So here in 1974, in her second book, she said, um, I hope I'm making it clear that patients do not necessarily follow a classical pattern from the stage of denial to the stage of anger bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Most of my patients have exhibited multiple stages simultaneously, mm -hmm. right? So here she's saying it's not linear. So right. you know, if you look up the Google critiques, complaints about the five stages, there many of them are, they're not linear. Well, she said this herself in black and white in a book. Uh, and then here in the same book, she says, please tie in the stages of dying with a loss of sight, meaning that they apply to other loss and change events, right? And this mm -hmm. later became the Kubler-Ross change curve, which is used, you know, by thousands of companies, and nobody complains about that. <laughs> um, identify, you know, a reaction to loss and change, which could be applied to grief, and yet maybe not, but it seems to be applied to everything. I think it's just the context in which people refer to it and how people interpret it and mm -hmm. put fill in, filler words. <laughs> I think people put their phone filler words in, you know, like right. instead of really looking at like we, what you just read, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, well, people hear what they want, right? I think that's right. really what it comes down to. People are yeah. going to hear what they want. And it, yes, it was like while she was writing at the stages of dying, 
but I think within months she changed it to the stages of grief or stages of loss. So I mean, she was also learning about it as she was writing about it, and I think, I mean, I think within twelve months she was saying, "Okay, it's not just that. I've realized it applies to other people and other things." So technically, yes, but I mean, by a few months. So I mean, are you going to hold her? It's like you're inventing the light bulb. Like, well, light bulb is only meant to be a light bulb, and then six months later, it's used for something else. Does that mean they were wrong? It's like, no, they were still learning. Right. Yes, originally in a six-month period. I mean, but over the last fifty years, you're going to hold her to that six-month period. Like, you know, you want to be a technocrat. Yes, she <laughs> just said it for that. But for a very brief moment, and even in a book, she's already beginning to identify. You know that the families are going through it. If you look on uh, what page one sixty-two, you'll see she's already beginning to refer to other people going through the stages. Right. And they're not stages, right? Though that's not. Yeah, that's. I think that's that word. (laughs) She used inverted comments to say, "Hey, I'm using this word, but I mean, don't hang me on this word." Right, and that's what they're doing. Stages or phases or periods or whatever. It's it's just a way to describe something. It's not, you know, a I'm from Switzerland and I don't have a great command of the English language, and b, you know, I've never written a book before, so don't hang me on like every nuance of every word. Right. I'm trying to have, uh, you know, give you a tool to build a conversation around this thing that no one's talking about. So, which she did. Yeah. And Ultimately, we're still, like, we're still debating it. Fifty years says, hey, <laughs> the fact that there's tens of thousands of people who said I went through the five stages says, hey, there's something to it. The fact that it's the most popular grief theory in the world, fifty years later, says, hey, there's got to be something to it. So, it's not the only one. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just a tool. You can use it. Don't use it. Just don't get hooked into it being like this, like written in stone. It's just a tool to begin framing a conversation. So that's all it is. You know, and we don't ask like, oh, well, what stage are you in? You ask, well, how are you feeling? You know, people do say that. (laughs) Really? Oh, yeah. I guess I haven't had people on my podcast who talk about grief, their grief. They haven't been asked that, like, oh, well, what stage are you in? But do people probably say behind their back, oh, what stage do you think she's in? You know, probably, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you look at (laughs) any number of dozens of TV shows, like. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah. Like Michael Douglas, you know, what's or or like, um, what was it? The Bucket List, right? Morgan Friedman. Yeah. Having a conversation. What stage are you in? Denial. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, certainly in TV and things like that. But I would hope in like real conversation. I don't know that that is necessarily. Yeah, but then that projects like, oh, well, maybe I should know what stage I'm in. Right. Yes. They're yeah. Morgan Freeman talking about it, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, oh, I should be I should be out of anger by now and (laughs) on to, you know, denial or, you know, whatever. Nicholson said he's in denial. What stage am I in? (laughs) Yeah. Crazy how that has just evolved over time. And I imagine we're, we could probably sit and have the same conversation maybe five, 10 years from now. Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, what, what has your grief taught you? I mean, cause you've lost, obviously you lost your mom and your dad and you've lost people and throughout your life and, mm-hmm. um, what has your grief taught you? Um, yeah, it's just a reminder that, you know, time is finite. Everything is finite. Every living thing is finite and everything you're doing is finite. So enjoy it, love it, absorb it, appreciate it, but just realize that you gotta let go. And roll the dice. Let go of everything, including yourself. So, mm. you know, just realize that everything is transitory in life and don't get, you know, it's one thing my father said to me when I was young was just, the people who succeed the best are the people who realize that everything in life is transitory, right? You know, whatever you're comfortable with, don't get too comfortable with it because people succeed when they learn to roll with changes. Everything changes, everything. You know, the love of your life, your pets, your whatever, your your health, your youth, your job, everything is transitory. So, you know, the people succeed who realize that 
you know, you can't hang on to it too tightly. That's very good advice. Mm -hmm. So where do you see yourself five, 10 years from now? Where would you like to see yourself five, 10 years from now? Where would you like to see the foundation? I have like three <laughs> questions in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to see us have a bigger staff. So I get some help, <laughs> of course. And, uh, you know, I'd love to have like 30 chapters around the world and the staff to support it, not just me. And uh, I'd like to see Stanford to continue to uh, evolve that digital library because I gave them 64 boxes of material. Uh -huh. So there's tons of tapes that have never been transcribed or really made public. So I just released a few on our YouTube channel. Um, but there's a, a lot of stuff. They said they want to go what they say they called it they want to go gold mining in my mom's paperwork and and find amazing things in there and they want to devote just a person just full time to kind of mine through elizabeth's archives wow that'd be a cool job yeah um is there anything else you would like to share either about your life your mom's work anything else uh, yeah, what do you I want people to know the most well i feel like i'm doing what i want like in five years like i'm doing it now like there's no like i'm aiming towards like like i said i want to do everything now so i'm trying to grow the foundation i'm trying to preserve our work for future generations i'm trying to kind of fight the misinformation about the five stages um trying to do this feature movie on mom because that will help younger generations get to know her who didn't grow up with her in the press so much and, uh, you know, just leave my mom's legacy in a way that's realistic and describes what she really did and the, the kind of wide breadth of her work, not just the silly five stages. Yeah. So, and, you know, I, I went to my 101 countries, so now I'm aiming for like 125, 135. So, but there's no particular number. I'm in a little competition with my cousin. He's, ah. at, he's at 104, so the competition's on. Oh, funny. <laughs> I want to keep doing it until my back gives out. Well, where can people find you if they want to either your personal work and also your mom's work? Um, well, uh, we have numerous websites in numerous languages. We have websites in English, French, Flemish, Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese. We have maybe a dozen Facebook pages, again, in various languages. We have EKR, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation, in Chile, in Argentina, Uruguay, in Peru, Guatemala, Mexico, Japan, Belgium, uh, French, um, hopefully starting Colombia soon. And so numerous websites, just type in Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation and pick your language. We're on Instagram, of course, and we have that in three languages. We're on LinkedIn. We are on Pinterest, and oh, then huh. I am on Instagram, Ken Ross Photography, and KenRossPhotography.com, and I'm on LinkedIn, and I think we do everything except TikTok so far. <laughs> <laughs> Where we draw the line. Snapchat. <laughs> yeah, Snapchat. <laughs> we don't do that either. <laughs> so, um, and then we, you know, we're working with other groups. Um, we're working with uh, like uh, Colin Perry. Do you know her? American no. Thanatologist. She does some really interesting work. Uh, we're doing a conference with her called The Nature of Grief, talking about how nature and grief combines like how are flowers used in Thanabotology. You know, we're trying to not, you know, not just do old school, but do new school too. And Cole's doing some great work. Uh, we're doing, uh, yeah, a number of interesting things with different uh, universities around the world. We're trying to do some projects with Stanford, with St. Christopher's, the first hospice in England. Oh. And uh, a number of different people, you know, in US, Canada, Mexico. I think we've got over 50 collaborations going. So it's a wide world out there. So it's trying to get the word out there and be part of the conversation. Um, and, you know, and there's other great groups like Reimagine and uh, uh, Michael Hebb's group is great. You know, the Death Cafes, the Death Over Dinner. Uh, a lot of great groups doing interesting work out there. Uh, the Green Burial Council. 
trying to uh, bury people in a more ecologically sound manner. So we're beginning to work with them. Amazing. So a, lot of, a lot of stuff happening. We're doing our education series in the fall. Uh, we have people usually from about 30 different countries attend that. We've had interesting speakers like uh, William Warden, Ira Bayak, some of my mom's workshop staff, uh, Joanne Cacciatore. Do you know about her and the Miss Foundation? She does amazing work. You should have her on your uh, on your call. Um, she has a grief farm up near Sedona, and she rescues animals. And she finds there's this beautiful bond between rescued animals and people going through grief, especially when they've lost children. And somehow they really attach on to rescued animals. There's like a shared grief and pain. Mm. Um, so she does amazing work, and she is just a brainiac. I, I love chatting with her. She is so wicked smart. Um, she did a book called Bearing the Unbearable. Beautiful book. Uh, got great reviews. I definitely recommend that book to anybody. And she works principally with parents who lost children. Amazing. So a lot of great people out there. I'm doing a project with Open to Hope next week. We're shooting a video in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Uh, so Gloria and Heidi Horsley, and they have the Open Hope channel on YouTube. Again, I, I um, it's just amazing to me that I pinned you down <laughs> for this conversation. <laughs> so again, thank you again so much for your time and sharing about your mom's work and um, about your life and your amazing insights into what you've learned from her, from your mom, and what you've applied from that in your own life. Uh, fun ride. Yeah, the dice theory. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will put, I guess I can't put all of those links to everything in the show right. notes, but um, I will definitely put where to contact you, um, the and foundation. Instagram and Facebook and the website maybe. Or... Yeah. Um, oh, and but... if you can... Um... Also, if people want to look, uh, learn more about Mom, Radio Lab just did a piece, National Public Radio's Radio Lab. Yes. If you type in Radio Lab Kubler Ross, they have an hour long piece that just came out last week. That's a great piece. It's kind of young, hip, and uh, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> it's, it's very different. <laughs> I think you mentioned earlier it's about 91% accurate. Yeah, it's like, you know, the MTV version of Elizabeth. It's like kind of <laughs> hip and trendy and irreverent, but they get it pretty close to right, you know? Okay. I will link to that one in the I show can, notes. I can argue with a few odds and ends, but what they say, the Mick Jagger of death had trouble dying herself. I'm like, well, <laughs> she had no trouble, you know, dying. It's like the stroke part was hard. It's hard for anybody, but <clears throat> she had no trouble with death. It's just being in pain for nine years not being able to work or have fun, you're going to be a little angry. <laughs> so. Right. Especially living the life she had led, right? Yeah. yeah. I she mean, a wild overachiever. So to go from 10,000% to, you know, 1% is hard. Yeah. And, but it's a and, good article. I really like the, you know, Rachel did a great, a great piece. So I, I have no issues with it. I really liked it a lot. It just makes you wonder, like just being a human being, it just makes you wonder someone who has, sparked such an amazing conversation to have about grief and opened up the the conversation in the first place and all the work that she has done and then that's what her last nine years were like it mm -hmm. it it's disheartening even for me you know to know that that's what that was like for her all right but if, take a look at that oprah interview on youtube and you'll see she still has a lot of spark left and even though she was retired and paralyzed, she still did like four books. You know? so yeah, that's true. She couldn't quite stop, stop. <laughs> well, and that's true. And that's, again, that speaks to don't put yourself in a box. Like, don't limit yourself. And I think that's one of the greatest messages today on this podcast from you and from her life is yeah, big chances. the, the only limitations you have are the ones that you put on yourself. Absolutely. I mean, I didn't study photography, but I went out and shot 101 countries and, you know, I did endless number of wacky things. <laughs> so. Do you think, though, that grief in part was her teacher in that? Like, really, to. Because what I believe is that grief is the. 
the illuminator. Like it really shows us the contrast of what we don't want. No, so that we really it. see what we do want. It's the equalizer and how much, how much money or fame or whatever we have, we're all going to die. Exactly. So, you know, we all end up at the same base there. <clears throat> right. So what do we do with this little short time we have? You know, make it seem like 100 lifetimes, you know, if you live it right. You can make, you know, I feel like I've lived 100 lifetimes already with all the stuff I've done. So. Yeah, I'm the, just a wee bit jealous. Life, go, wow, that was amazing. Like, I have no complaints. <laughs> like, lucky me. I'm, yeah, and I'm just a wee bit jealous. <laughs> just, but again, it's accepting where we are in our lives, like accepting mm -hmm. where we are. And this is where I'm meant to be as a mom of three kids. And um, National Geographic just wasn't my calling, I guess, when I was a kid. I didn't get married because I knew I wanted to travel and I didn't want to be an absentee parent like my mother was. Not that I have an issue with my mother, but I knew like, you know, I was different. I didn't mind it, but I didn't want to assume that my kids wouldn't mind me not being home because I really had to do that. I was really set. I'm going to go photograph 101 countries so and have all the experiences with go with that. Since you went there and since you mentioned that, can I ask then if that last, last nine years was really kind of a gift for you in that you had nothing but time with your mom to yeah, kind of connect in a deeper way? It was ironic because, you know, for the first nine years, she was a regular mom, and then she left to do her stuff. And for the last nine years, I was her parent, right? Wow. So it's kind of ironic that nine years here and nine years there, and in between, we like weaved in and out and hung out in, you know, funky places around the world. So for the last nine years, yeah, I got to spend, you know, all the time with her, even though she complains I was never around much. But her idea is like, <laughs> not much is like, you know, three, four times a week. I'm like, Mom, I, you know, I have a huge pile of your mail that I'm working on at home. It's like, ah, I don't care about that. I want some tea or I want to go shopping or I want to go you know, whatever. <laughs> like, Mom, you know, somebody has to do this stuff. And ah, <laughs> so, the, the problems with leaving a legacy, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm like, I'm going to inherit it one day, you know, my sister and I. So, you know, I'd like to inherit something that's kind of has structure and, <laughs> I can digest, not a chaos. Wow. So, I mean, I have like 7,000 emails right now and hundreds of messages. And this is, you know, 17 years after she died. So, it's and chaos. <laughs> so, I'm so grateful you answered mine. So, again. Oh, my pleasure. It's nice to you. stop and smell the roses. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again so much. I, I could just hang out all day. I really I could. could. Come back. <laughs> Would you? Sure. Oh, yay. Okay. I'm holding you to it. <laughs> hey, sounds good. All right. Thank you again. And remember, when you unleash your heart, you unleash your life. Much love.